love hearing about the Mothman. It's a classic for me. I'm still it's a, confused. It's a comfy classic. I am too. Hello, welcome to Guides the Unknown. I'm Kristen. And I'm her little brother, William. And this week, we're going back in time, which is then propelling us forward, I okay. think. <laughs> Slingshot-esque. Back to the future. Yep, to talk about the Mothman the once Moth again. The Mothman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you may have seen on the feed, we just re-released our original discussion about the Mothman because we've covered this topic before. Right. Way back in episode three. Yeah. A powerful, magical number. Mm -hmm. um, but back, you know, the way that we used to do Guide to the Unknown in the beginning for the first couple of years even, Kristen and I each had a topic. They'd get half a show apiece. Right. And occasionally we like to take some of those old topics that we think maybe deserve more time in the sun, mm -hmm. although sun might be... Uh, in the dark. Yeah, yeah in, the dark in the dark. dark the, of the moon. The, the poor Mothman can't handle the sunlight. Nah. Um, He's like old Chrissy. Yeah. Or, and, and old Willie. Yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> Ryan walked in the room the other day. I was I was hanging out in, our, in like our bedroom watching TV, and for some reason the light in the room was like all the way on, and as he walked out, he like turned it halfway down, Yeah, and I was like... Why'd you do that? And he was like, because you don't like it bright like that. Like, Chrissy doesn't like that. And I was like, you're absolutely right. It's very considerate. Yes. That's it's very great. nice. It's known. Um, but we feel that the Mothman has more to say. Mm -hmm. We're going to give him more room to spread out. Yeah, spread those wings. Yeah. Now, I also want to say, if you're joining us for the first time, because mm -hmm. we just uh, had a panel at PhenomenaCon. Right. Welcome. Yes. Welcome, hello. everybody. Hello, friends new and old who might have seen us there. Thank you so much for checking it out. We had a great time. We did. And obviously, thank you to the New Kirks for having us. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. It was really great. And I, I hope yeah. we get to do more sort of like team up stuff in the Me future. Too. Or I would love to. Appear places. It was it was really great. Yep. And it's a great community. So if you're coming mm -hmm. from uh, over there, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Now, I have to say, because of that, I felt a lot of pressure yeah. to try to do the Mothman justice. Right. And um, so I almost want to give a disclaimer. Yeah, I think that's fine. Two things. One of the two of us, I am certainly on the skeptic side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other important thing is I feel, perhaps correctly or incorrectly, I'm not really sure, that the Mothman is just so beloved. Right. I'm afraid of not <laughs> capturing what people want me to talk about. I, right? I think anything in the Mothman field, you're going to be fine. There's just, there's a lot of detail. You're not an anthropologist. No. It's all good. And th there are so many things that have happened or things people have said or so many theories. I can't possibly cover them all on our like sort of like comedy show. Of course not. Um, but I do love this stuff. So I also want to learn it for my sake. Right. Um, yeah, because, it's just fun. Yeah, exactly. So I think I would also like to mention, since you bring that up, if you are joining us from the uh, Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult, Will has not watched Hellier. So he right. doesn't have that sort of um, angle on Mothman. Right. So if you're like yelling at your phone or something like that, that is why. And I think that we will cover Hellier all together in a future episode. As a matter of fact, before I forget, I have brought over... The Blu-rays for you. Oh, awesome. Haba. Cool. I'm going to check yes. them out. Honestly, my limited interactions with um, Greg and Dana, mm -hmm. I, I texted Kristen right after and I was like, I, I really like them. I oh, feel yeah. like very aligned to them and specifically the way that Greg talked about the community mm -hmm. of like people who uh, believe in something and are having fun with something and just want to create and support. Like I'm so constantly trying to be on that like positivity train yeah um, they I, rule. I really really liked them yeah and so yeah i'm gonna dig into that show thank you for bringing those you're welcome so let's talk about the mothman mm -hmm. knowing that yes we have discussed the mothman previously i don't want to completely redo that sure. show but i do need to hit some of the big stuff mm -hmm. actually here's something fun um if i give you one minute to just say everything you can possibly say about the mothman okay do you think you can do that yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it'll be accurate or whatever, but I can certainly give it a shot. The Mothman in one minute. Okay. Let's give it a shot. All right. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, the Mothman is a supposed cryptid that was first seen in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Um, he is believed to possibly live in a power plant there. He is thought to be perhaps responsible for the Silver Bridge collapse and or... Uh, uh, what do you call that? A, harb a harbinger? 
an um, omen, a bad an omen, omen. like yeah. a bad omen warning that that was about to happen um, around the same time that people were seeing the Mothman there, which was like the late 60s, I think. There was also a guy named Woody Derringer who was he had an encounter with a being that called itself Indrid Cold. And uh, these things seem to be intertwined in a way. And now Point Pleasant, Virgin West Virginia really hangs its hat on the ma- Mothman. There's a statue of the Mothman that's a thick boy. It has butt crack. <laughs> um, and it's this really cool thing. Wow, you did it. Kristen, that was one minute. Oh, really? That okay, was the good. Mothman in a minute. Yeah. That was impressive. A Mothman minute. I have to say, you hit on... Or Darren Berger, maybe. Um, yeah, I've got it in yeah. here somewhere. We'll get to it. Mm-hmm. I'll give you the whatever name. You, I think you were right, though. Yeah. But so I, um, you, like the Mothman, I think have predicted so much that I'm going <laughs> right. to tell you. So much right? to come, yeah. Um, but I think that that's kind of interesting because one of the things that I found daunting about covering the Mothman was that I was under the impression there was a lot. Right. There's really not that much. Yeah. Or at least there's not a lot of, there are not many sightings that people all seem to agree on except for the original sightings in 1966 and 1967. Mm -hmm. Everything after that point is almost treated like um, hearsay or or rumor, but we all regard the 66, 67 sightings as fact. It really sticks in the mind. I think maybe partially because they were covered so um, extensively in the book, The Mothman Prophecies yeah. by John Keel. So maybe yeah. that's why they became the definitive thing. But also I think, you, you'll you know better than I am, I think part of the lore is that he wasn't really seen after that time in that area. The Mothman? Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, I mean, people certainly seem to to claim him all over the place. Right, but not in West Virginia, right? Um, I don't I don't think, not that I saw. I, I did. Basically, I'm saying that because at the end, so I'll be talking to you about the movie, The Mothman Prophecies, yeah. and that movie ends with um, text on the screen like a coda that says that the Mothman has been seen all over the world since, but never again in Point Pleasant. Yeah, I think that is correct. What I know is, so there's the Chicago Mothman. Mm -hmm. Is that the same Mothman? I I don't know. know. I don't know. We've talked about the Chicago Mothman before, I think in episode 146. It was a, it's called The Year in Weird, that episode. I can't remember which number it is though. Right. But so like, is it the same Mothman who's traveling around? Because honestly, and this is, uh, we're not trying to tie this into this, but it is a thing. People say that the Mothman was seen around the time of uh, the Chernobyl meltdown. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like all these things. So is it one being or a race of beings that are going all over the place to give, Right. I mean, what? Is vague, it a species? Vague cryptic warnings yeah. that nobody could ever interpret correctly. Yeah, how is it even a warning if how, you just yeah. show up? Here's the other thing that I'm nervous about. In many places, on shows and in person, yeah. I have said to people, I don't get it. Uh I know that the Mothman is beloved, but I personally, I struggle to understand it. I'm very confused about what this is even supposed to be. It's like, it's like that scene in Seinfeld where Kramer accidentally gets that job. And he what carries job? he carries a, a suitcase, oh, yes. a briefcase okay. that has crackers has in, it. in it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And his boss fires him and he goes, this report you turned in. It's almost as if you have no formal <laughs> training so of any kind. I don't even know what this is supposed to be. And Kramer goes, I was just trying to get ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like nothing. Like I sort of feel like that's what this is. I don't know what I'm looking at. There are so many mishmash things that don't seem to fit together uh-huh. of UFO, men in black, uh, cryptid. Um, is it a premonition? Um, is it itself a creature that's terrorizing people? Nobody, there is no definitive answer, which of course is part of the appeal of everything that we don't know. And so it, it, it makes your imagination go wild and fill in blanks. But I feel like there are so many, uh, so many uh, elements of the story that are at odds with each other. They're at cross purpose yeah. that I just end up, it almost runs into white noise in my head where I, I can't, I physically can't retain memory of what the Mothman story is even supposed to be. I have to tell you, I feel somewhat similarly. I don't really understand where the intersection of Indrid Cold and Mothman are. It almost seems like they just happened around the same time. That's correct. But they're now inextricably linked. And so I, I feel similarly, I think because 
I have really liked the Mothman story like a million people ever since I heard about it. I've come to just accept it as all one thing that I don't yeah. completely get. Right. But I totally understand what you're saying. It's it's complicated. So mm-hmm. I, I even found a timeline. And check our show notes, gttupod.com. We'll have like the full listing of this episode with the full sources as always. Yep. I found a timeline from timetoast.com that starts in like, you know, 66. Mm-hmm. Goes to 67, and then there was a gap of like 30 years. Before the Chicago Mothman sightings? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And it's like... Yeah, because I hadn't heard of anything about the Mothman until that Chicago stuff. So here's the thing. I think, um, and I'm going to talk about this guy a little bit later. There's a folklorist that I've been reading so much of. You got me one of his books. Mm-hmm. Jan Harold Brunvand. Right. He is the folklorist credited with popularizing the term urban legend, with bringing the idea of urban legends to the average person. He has evidently had a lot to say about the Mothman in one of his books that I don't have, unfortunately. Hmm. But um, a, a big part of urban legends and folklore is the idea that sometimes there are like these waves of popularity. Yeah. Like it can it can be that there's in the 60s this burst of sightings, then it goes dormant for a while, and then some event happens that makes people dust off that story and suddenly it's popular again. Right. It's also, I mean, this is a little dopier, but it's also like, you know, Star Wars happened in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. and then they revived it around the 2000s, and it's like, let's dust off an old franchise and make it new again. Yeah. And then when we when we revised the revived the Mothman story in like the late 90s, we've just stuck with it now for almost 30 years. Right. And and we rally around it though I I can't really understand. I guess Why? everything goes in cycles. Yeah, you know? like fads. whether it's it's orchestrated by like entertainment world or just our own internal clocks right. collectively somehow go like we're interested in the Mothman again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know? it's just it's puzzling. I like even... there's tons of Mothman merch and stuff, and there have been for a few years now. Oh sure, but like the Mothman is extremely hot. Yeah, well let's let me um let me. Ju- now, I'm not I, I just talking down... about that thick statue. <laughs> Why is it so thick? You have sure? you ever seen it? It's got. I've I've looked at pictures of it only from the front. Am I sure? Yes, he's got like meaty thighs and a, a human butt. A big a human yeah. butt. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> ah, okay. It's like a it's like a known joked about thing. So I I wrote down all my notes as a timeline, um, and at the end of the timeline, or really, I mean, when the Mothman gets real big again, mm-hmm. two thousand two, the movie The Mothman Prophecies comes out. Also two thousand two, the first ever Mothman festival is held. Um, This is from Wikipedia about the Mothman. The Mothman Festival began after brainstorming creative ways for people to visit Point Pleasant. Yeah, that makes sense. Right? Mm -hmm. It just puts them on the map. It brings in tourism dollars, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember? I mean, it was in like the early days of the show. It it honestly probably was like when we were doing the Mothman episode. Um, I found out that there was a Mothman museum. It's yes. kind of more of a gift shop, and it had a live camera feed to that it. That was in the Mothman But it episode. didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it didn't work. We tried yeah. to go to it on the show. Okay. Well, I do have a link, and I'll put it in the show notes. Does uh, it work now? There's a Mothman cam on the statue. So you can watch oh, it 24 okay. hours a day. And there are people, there's like a clip of somebody dressed like the Mothman visiting it in the middle of the night. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And leaving an offering in front that's of it, fun. which is kind of cool. So 2003, the statue is made. 2005, the museum opens. Mm-hmm. So really, I would posit that the popularity of the Mothman is a great marketing campaign by Point Pleasant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably that's true. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, it's just... Yeah, maybe it, it kind of snowballed from there. I feel like it didn't get super popular again, though, until years after 2005. Like, I feel like everyone started yeah. talking about the Mothman a lot, maybe in the last five years. 2016 is when you get the Chicago uh-huh. Mothman. Yeah. Um, 2017, 2018 is when Guide to the Unknown talks about it mm-hmm. um, for the first time. So people really freaked out That's when we did that. That's when it created a big sonic really exploded. Boom. There was like a wave across the country. Um, I wrote about the Mothman in the Hunt to Killer Blair Witch series. Right. You and I played characters in a fictional podcast within the Blair Witch Universe and officially licensed Lionsgate Correct. edition of the Blair Witch franchise where we talk about the Mothman. Mm-hmm. So we did that. So honestly, it makes sense. 2018, I wrote a uh, an audio drama called Blackwood mm-hmm. about three kids who investigate something called the Blackwood Bug Man. Right. It's half man, half bug. So, you know, it goes on I don't and know on. why we're acting like we're surprised. It's mostly us. Yes. <laughs> if I'm being yeah. right. It's mostly us, obviously. <laughs> All right, so let's go way back to the beginning. I'll make it fast because it's it's sort of touching on the stuff that you described in your 
One Minute Mothman. Okay. I mean, go to town. The earliest credited sighting, 1966, November 12th. Five men digging a grave near Point Pleasant say they saw, quote, a brown human being Mm. that flew right over their heads. Okay. I have that from OutsideOnline.com. A few days later, this is the big one. 1966, November 15th, our father's birthday. Love you, Pop. Love you, Pop. Roger and Linda Scarberry. Roger. (gasps) <gasps> Richard Rogers. Oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> there are two couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry and Steve and Mary Mallet, who are on a lover's lane mm-hmm. that is also near, quote, a decommissioned explosives factory from World <laughs> War II. I know. Trying to see some fireworks. <laughs> oh, they're trying to create some fireworks. I guess so. They see a seven foot tall white creature. Which is interesting. I feel like he's more commonly described as being black. I didn't remember that. A uh, white creature with red eyes and large wings. It follows them, even hovering above their car, flying it up to 100 miles per hour. That I remember is that they were like really gunning it. Yeah. And the Mothman was able to keep a pace with them. I have a quote here. It says, um, let's see if that bastard can do 90. <laughs> <laughs> Run for it, Marty. Yeah. Uh, no, here's an actual quote from one of them. It was a bird or something. It definitely wasn't a flying saucer, hmm. which makes me think it definitely was. Yeah, right. Why would you, why would you even say that? <laughs> it then? definitely wasn't a flying saucer. Interesting. Um, this was covered in the news quite heavily. So you know that people were like at least experiencing something. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like at least my skeptic brain goes like, maybe it's all fabricated. Right. And admittedly, I looked at newspaper articles for this show that I tried to find the original source for mm-hmm. like on like newspapers.com yeah. and struggled so at a certain point I just assumed that all newspapers were fake because I can fake a newspaper yeah that's... I can come up with a, something that looks like a newspaper I mean I easily. had I made my own newspaper it's easy it was called the spiritual <laughs> gazette how many issues one oh. <laughs> and it was only horoscopes right how old were you like I must have been like second grade or something. Right. It's only horoscopes. The horoscopes for anybody who were, you know, like you fell in, you know, Scorpio and my family, I geared it toward getting you to buy me something. Oh, that's right. And then it said that there were hieroglyphics to translate. Unfortunately, they were wingdings. I know that's not cool, but I was like seven or something. Yeah, you didn't know that. And the they was going spelled on. out spirituality. <laughs> spirituality. <laughs> There's a picture of it on my uh, my Instagram, which is at Chill and Kristen. You have to scroll back a little bit. We can but. only hope for a second edition. Mm. Um, so here's a, an article. This is from the Gettysburg Times, uh, December 1st, 1966. Headline, Monster Bird with Red Eyes May Be a Crane. The Mysterious Mothman, they already had a name. Uh-huh. That quickly, they were calling him Mothman. I bet they're like, this is how you sell papers. They were, I read they a few. They branded this bird. I read a few people, and I think it's, I would love to see like the the time that somebody was like, what do we call this thing? Yeah, right. Wing guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, Batman, uh-huh. the 1966 Batman series was brand new. Oh, okay. So they couldn't go with Batman. They went with Mothman. Did you look that up? Did you think of that? No, people. I saw it said like like. Not, I've never heard that before. That makes total sense. Though. I don't have a I don't have a singular source for it because I saw several people just sort of comment it. Right. Not like officially. So I would love to see like the moment that it was coined or something. But that's but no, what some people say. That could be that they could think Batman. Eh, I can't be Batman. Yeah. yeah. Or you know, it's a moth and it's a guy. It's mm-hmm. well, Batman, Mothman. Right. Mothman. Mothman. Yeah. So the mysterious Mothman was still at large near this normally quiet Ohio River community, but the excitement he caused is dying down. The excitement began two weeks ago. During the next three days, at least eight persons reported various similar creatures. On November 18th, two volunteer firemen, Captain Paul Yoder and Benjamin Enox, said they saw what definitely was a very large bird with large red eyes. Hmm. So this pokes a big hole right in the like it's a big monster thing if you've got these two guys that are like well we literally we saw a definitely huge saw bird. a giant bird yeah and it had red eyes right dr robert l smith associate professor of wildlife biology at wvu which i think i've spoken at mm. um digitally oh okay. remotely for a class that's cool uh said the descriptions all fitted the sand hill crane the second largest American crane, which stands almost as high as a man and has a wingspan of more than seven feet. That's freaky. 
It's terrifying. That's really, really big. But it's a great description. A bird that stands as high as a man. Yeah, and has a wingspan of seven feet. That's, I don't care for that. He said the red eyes could be the large circles of bare reddish flesh around the crane's eyes. Smith said the bird had apparently wandered out of his normal migratory route. Hence, why people in Point Pleasant would be like, what the hell is right, that? Right, right. Because they don't commonly see that bird. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that it can't, you know, arrive in that area. Right. There are like very early reports of people trying to describe through letters mm-hmm. what the hell an elephant is. <laughs> yeah, right. It had it, a you huge just nose. seen it before. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, how do you even picture it? So it, right. it explains a lot. So I wrote down this in my notes. Does this explain Mothman sightings or... Uh, to go with fun conspiracy, mm-hmm. is this newspaper article stretching to try and explain what was actually a real monster? Because it also doesn't, I get it, it doesn't necessarily refute every Mothman sighting. These guys saw a bird. Right. It this, doesn't mean this one was refuted. Maybe the bird was sighted in addition to the monster. Yeah. True. Maybe everybody who saw the monster. Maybe half of them saw the bird, but half of them saw the monster. Right. Oh. Right. Now, I don't believe that. But there's right. enough room for you to to, to sure. wiggle your way into. Sure. This one is disproven, but not necessarily all the others. Exactly. So here's here's a huge moment that you mentioned. 1967, December 15th. Supposedly, the Mothman is spotted perched on or flying over the Silver Bridge. Mm-hmm. And then the Silver Bridge collapses. 46 people lose their lives. Right. Two of them are never even found, which is so frightening. I know. It's like unthinkable. They're just gone. Yeah. Can you imagine that? If like, if there was, and this is, I'm not trying to, you know, make fun, spooky quality out of this, but it happens. And I'm sure it's yeah. happening right now, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that just one day something bad happens and I'm never seen again. I know. Not a body, nothing. I'm just gone yeah what do you do with that how do you ever i never pick up the stop pieces and, <laughs> you keep looking for i never stop until i find you here i am yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pop out of a bush the ultimate game of hide and seek yes um now a lot of people say that the mothman was maybe predicting this mm-hmm. um event some people were like did he cause it or is he predicting it or whatever right i think here and i'm guessing i'm guessing this is my speculation i think Maybe early on people were like, he caused it. Uh huh. And then information like this came out fairly quickly. Quote, analysis showed that the bridge was carrying much heavier loads than it had originally been designed for. And it had been poorly maintained. I mean. So it doesn't take a monster to destroy the bridge. Right. That'll do it. When the bridge was first constructed, 1928, by the way. So and it collapsed, what, 40 years later? Yeah. 39 years later. Cars weighed about 1,500 pounds. At the time of the collapse of the bridge, the average car weighed 4,000 pounds. Oh, my God. Not to mention how much heavier trucks had gotten. Right. This happened during a rush hour type traffic, bumper to bumper traffic. Mm -hmm. It was carrying far more than it was ever built to hold. Right. There are also um, explanations about how the construction of the bridge made it difficult to inspect. Mm. So it actually became a lesson in designing bridges. Yeah. From this point on. Design them so that we can check them Mm -hmm. for safety. Man. So he might not have caused it. Right. But again, you know, thinking generously or, you know, whatever, (laughs) whateverly, maybe it was a warning. I and that's flying all over it, being like, look, look at this thing. But see, do you I guess my point is like, did that did that development of the Mothman story of like he predicts things? Mm -hmm. Was that always part of it prior to this? Or was it like they were like, he destroyed the bridge. And they're like, well, the bridge had a thousand reasons why it collapsed. So Otherwise, he predicted like, it. Then he predicted it. Yeah, right. Just refusing to let go. Like John Lovitz. Then he predicted the collapse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I, I I don't. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. So um, the Mothman Prophecies book mm-hmm. comes out in 1975. Um, you are so good. It was written by John Keel. Yeah. How did... I don't know. He's a famous like writer about weird paranormal stuff. He has other books. So Flying Saucer, The Scent of Your Mind, I think. Good and God. Yeah. <laughs> so this is from Wikipedia, and I, I found these to be two enlightening passages. The book combines uh, accounts 
of the Mothman with his theories about UFOs and various supernatural phenomena, ultimately connecting them to the collapse of the Silver Bridge across the Ohio River. Official investigations, blah, 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 caused by stress corrosion cracking in an eye bar, blah, blah, blah. In the May slash June 2002 issue of Skeptical Inquirer, journalist John C. Sherwood, a former business associate of UFO researcher Gray Barker, published an analysis of private letters between Keel and Barker during the period of Keel's investigation. Mm-hmm. In the article, Gray Barker's Book of Bunk. <laughs> That's awesome. Keep it next to the Uncle John's bathroom reader or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Sherwood reported finding significant differences between what Keel wrote at the time of his investigation and what he wrote in his first book about the Mothman reports, raising questions about the book's accuracy. Hmm. Sherwood also reported that Keel, who was well known for writing humorous and outrageous letters to his friends and associates, would not assist him in clarifying the differences. Why'd they make a point of saying that he wrote humorous letters to his friends and associates? What uh, does that have to do with anything? You're right. It does feel... Like it has nothing. To it do doesn't with matter. I, You're right. Yeah. I, I think to, certainly there's a perspective on this that I think I baldly I feel more aligned to of just being like, here are the holes. Uh huh. Let's dig into the holes of this whole thing. Yeah. His notes at the time don't match what's in the book, but certainly there is an angle of this, right? Yeah. And the angle is. He's known for writing humorous and outrageous things. So he's a liar. Right, right. If you're funny, you're not trustworthy. We can't yeah, I trust guess you're what right. you say. I didn't think about that. But yes, that is what the angle is. Yeah. So I read some of the book. Mm-hmm. I downloaded the book. Yeah. I bought the book. Um, the opening chapter is fascinating. Have you ever read this? Yes. Okay. The opening chapter immediately launches into a story. Mm-hmm. I lo- I'm not a folklorist. I love folklore. Yeah. I love urban legends. Here's a spooky story. A couple is startled in the middle of the night by a sudden knock at their front door. When they go to answer it, they are greeted with a man, a tall, bearded man who asks to come in and use their phone. William. What? You. Me? Are a tall, bearded man. No. No. Can I use your phone? No. Um, They do not allow him to come inside. Shortly thereafter, they die. In the collapse of the Silver Bridge. Mm. The movie, The Mothman Prophecies, I believe, sort of dramatizes this story from yeah. the book. Can I come in and use your phone? Yeah. And makes it good and spooky. <laughs> well, here's what happens in the book. The very next segment of the book is John Keel going, the man at the door was me. My car broke down in the middle of nowhere, and I was trying to find somebody who would let me use their phone. Right. And John Keel himself makes a point of saying, absolutely mundane events can turn into scary stories and folklore. Mm -hmm. Just because you do not know why that man is at your front door does not make him some omen of bad tidings to come. He reports that this story of somebody showing up in the middle of the night asking to use the phone was later relayed by person, you know, friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, and it became the devil visited this couple in the middle of the night. A tall, bearded man. Right. Um, No, it was him. And then the rest of this book, he will sort of tell these stories, and ultimately his book is used to hold up the idea of the Mothman as fact. Yeah. And I find that really interesting when the opening passage... Is that sometimes things are just as they seem. Yeah, just as they seem or not knowing doesn't mean that there's not a great explanation. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't know. Right. Um, I have a review from somebody who's named Will Ah. on Goodreads who gave it a two out of five. I'm giving this book two stars rather than just one because of the seemingly unintentional hilarity of it as well as its psychological depth. John Keel is clearly both delusional and megalomaniacal, and this book chronicles what appears to be his descent into madness. <laughs> I mean, he's known to be kind of like an a-hole. Is that right? Yeah. What, what so, do you know about him? Um, I mean, I don't know like loads about him, but yeah, I think he was really full of himself, um, kind of like talked crappy about women. Oh, really? Um, definitely like fat phobic sort of stuff. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Pro- probably more, but yeah. that's off the top, and I don't want to speculate because <laughs> I don't remember. Fair enough. My favorite parts are the ones where he goes out to an abandoned road at night to commune with the Mothman by himself with no witnesses or cameras to prove it. Well, 
So yeah, this is a weird one. I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a kick out of it, though. Which I think is ultimately, for me, the culmination of this. Mm -hmm. At the core, it's enjoyable, fair, just like everything else. Yeah. It's just fun. But I guess part of what was so intimidating to me before looking into some of this myself is like how beloved it appears to be. I think you're fine. Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, but I, I just, uh, it's it's impressive to me almost that the Mothman seems to be so much bigger than so many right. other things. It does, it carries like a pomp and circumstance to me that a lot of other cryptids and folklore just don't seem to have. Yeah, no, the Mothman definitely has legs. Yeah, thick ones. Thick ones. <laughs> yeah. So I have two quick things. Okay. One, you mentioned Indrid Cold. Mm -hmm. Indrid Cold, I am fascinated by because of the one scene in the movie. Right. The Mothman Prophecies. It's the greatest scene in the movie. It creeps me out. I, I think it's fantastic. We'll mm -hmm. talk about it in a bit, I'm sure. Yep. But Indrid Cold comes from, you know, the, this, like, this book. It's a, another creature that people have encountered. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been confused about what the hell Indrid Cold's supposed to be as well, because some people insist that he is the Mothman. Right. Um, the movie certainly seems to say the Mothman and Indrid Cold are one and the same. Almost the way that Pennywise... I can't figure out what the movie is saying about Indrid Cold and the Mothman. So you might be completely right, but they just felt like, I don't know, they were on parallel tracks in a way, just timeline-wise, but it didn't really ever make any conclusions about it. The movie? Which I guess is, you know, true. I guess there aren't any conclusions to draw. But the movie is fictionalized enough that I'm surprised... That it didn't make more of an effort to tie it all together. I'll tell you what. The movie is a mess. Yeah, it's not good. A, an absolute mess. Mm -hmm. um, so in the movie, they they treat it like Pennywise going like, hi, my name's Bob Gray. Yeah. And it's almost as if Indrid Cold is somehow an alias for the Mothman when he communicates in English or yeah. in human form or yeah, something like that. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe that is kind of what um, it's getting at. But here's what it appears to be at the beginning. Like you said... 1960s um, Point Pleasant, it wasn't just Mothman stuff. People were seeing UFOs. Mm -hmm. It was all happening at the same time. So a lot of people draw a line between the two. There was Mothman, and we talk about the Mothman, or we talk about the UFOs. But because people talk about both those things, it conflates. And so you get right. Mothman plus UFO, and I don't know what we're doing. Yeah, they are all kind of mushed together. They get mushed together. But here is from the original book, chapter 5, the cold who came down in the rain. Mm -hmm. And I love that yeah, title. Good. It's like good and spooky. Yeah. Woodrow Derenberger, who you mentioned before, mm -hmm. is the guy who talked about meeting Indrid Cold. I got a little familiar with him. I called him Woody. Woody. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's your pal. Your old yeah. pal Woody. So uh, this is a quote from the book. I wrote it down because it was just so awesome. He encounters uh, him on a road. The stranger was about five feet, ten inches tall with long, dark hair combed straight back. His skin was heavily tanned, grinning broadly, his arms crossed and his hands tucked under his armpits. He walked to the panel truck. I think his truck broke down. Mm. He was wearing a dark top coat. Underneath it, Woody could see some kind of garment made of glistening greenish material, almost metallic in appearance. Mm. So, Indrid Cold's an alien doing a bad job. Of acting at, like a human. Of acting like a human. And covering up his alien skin. <laughs> He's got his hands in his armpits like yeah. mary Catherine gallagher gallagher <laughs> and he sniffs him like that yeah and he can you can see under his top coat where he's wearing glistening green metal which is like or is that his glistening green skin maybe i mean it's like what the the green goblin wears you know yeah, it's yeah. like both kind of green and yeah. purple it's willem <laughs> dafoe is injured cold i'm something of an alien myself now this next thing doesn't happen in quotes it's not dialogue mm -hmm. as written right do not be afraid the grinning man did not speak aloud. Woody sensed the words. We mean you no harm. I come from a country much less powerful than yours. He asked for Woody's name. Woody told him. My name is Cold. I sleep, breathe, and bleed even as you do. Okay, what a cool, normal thing to say, human to human. Great to meet you. Yeah. Carbon-based life form. Right. <laughs> Stranger. <laughs> it's baffling. Yeah. So Indrid Cold is a completely other creature. Yeah. Maybe of the same origin or something. I don't know why one's a moth and one's a, a, a smelly armpit guy in a top know. coat. Um, but that's they're two distinctly separate things, even though the Mothman Prophecies movie sort of implies that they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. It's very, very strange. And here's the last thing I want to say to you, ever, 
t- no. Yeah, this is it. This is before you disappear forever. Yeah, poof. Um, I got this from CryptoZooNews.com. Um, they cite a magazine. It was a real magazine called Soldier of Fortune. Mm-hmm. It was like an army magazine kind of thing. In their February 2014 issue, they claim that they know the truth about the Mothman. Okay. Here is what it is. They talk about how, quote, special operations forces near Point Pleasant, West Virginia, were testing high altitude, low opening. Oh, right. I remember this. Parachuting for use in Vietnam. It's mm-hmm. called halo jumping. You jump real high and you don't open your parachute till you get real low. The jumpers used luminous paint so that they could be seen during the tests. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to I've tried to verify this by finding the magazine itself. Can't find it. So take this with a grain of salt, but I find it to be fascinating. Um, many of the tests that of that procedure occurred near Point Pleasant. The jumpers used paint that temporarily glowed in the dark to keep track of personnel. What the Green Berets making those jumps hadn't figured on was the fact that people on the ground could see it as well. This included the Amorous Couple, who made the report on the 15th of November, 1966. The luminous paint worked so well in tests, special force troops used the paint in Southeast Asia. Hmm. And so here's really what I posit. And for people who are watching the video version, this is what it looked like, Mm -hmm. if you want to describe it for people. Sure. So it looks like somebody wearing a bunch of heavy black gear that makes their midsection especially kind of look wider, which I say because it's not totally impossible, I guess, that you could look at that and think that maybe there's something protruding from a midsection, sort of like wings. Yeah. And then there's a very teeny little parachute. What the hell's going on here? I think it's got to be that there's more parachute above that. (laughs) There's no way that there's just that little parachute. I don't understand what I'm looking at. I mean, there must be more, but it is, is it invisible? Weird. I mean, it's a little parachute. So anyway, you could you could potentially perhaps not really see the parachute. And there's text at the bottom that says, a member of the 19th Special Forces Group comes in for a landing after a halo jump. Similar jumps in the area of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, gave rise to the Mothman legends. Hmm. Photo by the Utah National Guard. And any drawing that I've seen of the Mothman... It's as if there's if, as if there's like a human with no head. Right. Like it's yes. all a straight line from shoulder to shoulder. Yep. And I gotta say, very boxy. This. It's not dissimilar. No. From it's what not. this looks like. So here's what I'm gonna posit ultimately. Mm-hmm. What if it's everything? That's what I think. Right. What if it's people doing these like orbital space boys super duper halo jumps? Yeah. And a crane. Right. That was off of its typical migratory path. Right. Why not both? Yes. And I'm going to do you one better. Maybe not better, but further. So what if it's those things, people see them, but they think it's some sort of monster. Then we're all talking about Mothman. Point Pleasant is abuzz with the talk of Mothman. What if perhaps this gives form to a thought form? Mm -hmm. And so there is a Mothman of another dimension or another plane of existence. Okay. That is born of the imaginations of the people of Point Pleasant. So there is a there there yes. it's all of this and there's still a Mothman. Yes. But it's not even that there was all of this and still like a UFO or a cryptid. It's all of this and then it created the Mothman. Right. right. What okay, how about this? I'll give you this one. Okay. People are doing these halo jumps. There is a crane that's off its migratory path. There is a Mothman who's also in the area swooping around. Mm-hmm. And then all of these sightings create a thought form of a second Mothman. Okay. And that goes to Chicago? No. They all they all party together. Okay. Look. Have a good time. And Andrew Cold's there. Uh-huh. And he's sniffing his fingers. Uh-huh. And he's watching. <laughs> and he likes what he sees. Watching and waiting. Waiting and watching. Yeah. I don't know. So there you go. That's it's my a fun story. That's my version of coverage of the Mothman. I think you did a great job. I don't know what you were apprehensive about. I'm just afraid of everything. <laughs> I know. No, you. I, I really think you did a great job. You've got nothing to be. There's nothing to fear. Thank you. But fear itself. Thank you. Sure. I love hearing about the Mothman. It's a classic for me. I'm still it's a, confused. It's a comfy classic. I am too. I'm but still confused. It just feels and people good. say that maybe he lived in that World War II bombing right. factory, or maybe he's a mutated bird. Right. Yep. But like, there's just so many things. There are a lot of things, and people it's love undeniable. it so much. But I, I guess the problem is I don't understand how you can be so passionate about something that I'm so confused about that I can't even 
grasp it. Because I think that some people go like really far with it. And so you I'm are. I'm thrilled they love it, by the way. It's not a criticism. Oh, of I know. Anyone. But you're able to kind of become obsessed with it because there are so many angles to go down right. and connections to posit. Like, it's not just thinking about the Mothman itself, which is its own whole thing. You can also think about Injured Cold. That's its own whole thing. And how do those connect? Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. There's just, there's, there is a lot and it's confusing. Yeah. But then that also leaves a lot of room for fun and speculation. Fair enough. You know? Certainly, certainly Injured Cold. Mm -hmm. I love the name. Yeah. I love the idea of somebody who's just like kind of grinning and Do doing a bad job of blending in. I think I mentioned it in the after show last week, but it was such a cool, f weird, fun thing. I covered just the Indrid Cold story itself in an episode at, yeah. at some point. And it turned out that the day that I covered that, we also got a message from somebody that I didn't see saying, oh, hey, you guys should cover Indrid Cold. Oh. Remember? Yes, I do. Because yeah, I started yeah, yeah. telling the story and then you were like, Oh yeah, from that message, and I was like, "That's I don't know right." What you're talking about like it was as we're recording, so if you find that episode, it's there. Yeah, and Will's like, "Yeah, we got this Facebook message," and I was like, "Whoa, I have no idea." Yeah. yeah, it's all it's all it's all synchronicity and serendipity. Mm -hmm. One of the things I said when I released the the rewind of how we covered Mothman in episode three, um, one of the things that I say to you, and that I was like, I thought it had something to do with numerology. Oh, and I was like, why did I think that? Then I also watched the Mothman prophecies. Mm -hmm. And in that, they're constantly being like getting messages of being like 99 dead at the ninth hole or 34 mm -hmm. plus 29 equals dead or something like that. And I'm like, I think there's just two numbers. Things. It's because the movie, yeah. the movie does something with numbers, even though it's not part of the actual mythos. No, yeah, it has like injured cold kind of like give numbers yeah. that then correspond to things that happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a Will Smith or not Will Smith, the Nicolas Cage movie. They're oh, so numbers? Similar. Yeah, yeah. where he's... Obs Did you write that down? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, uh, one more thing that springs to mind about the idea of the halo jumps. Mm -hmm. People not only were seeing UFOs at that time, but also then getting... They were getting claims of men in black coming and telling people, yeah, that's shut your a, mouth, that's don't talk about this. That's a whole thing as well, right. Of course. So like, it's like the Mothman's like a wellspring into every other kind of paranormal thing. It completely is. It branches off in a ton of different directions. But what I want to say is that if we're to take for granted, if we take it at, at face value and as a fact that people were doing halo jumps, mm -hmm. they were jumping out of an aircraft. Those are the UFO sightings. Yeah. If they were experimenting with military tech right, and didn't want people to talk about it, that explains the men in black. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where it's like Occam's razor. Like, isn't it, if we, and I, I I hope it's, you know, I don't. it's not that I hope it's true for any other reason than like, I hope that I gave people accurate information. Mm -hmm. If it's a fact that they were doing halo jumps, then everything else lines up. Almost right. everything else line, like falls into place. Right. Rather than being a thousand different unrelated spokes, mm -hmm. it's all one story. Mm -hmm. The government was doing Except stuff. Except for injured cold. Maybe he was a man in black. That's one weird ass man in black. Also, he's speaking into that man's mind. Well, that's, I mean, it's all crazy, <laughs> I know, right? I, I mean, it's all wild. But it's not because there are reports of like men in black, men in black, like guys in suits coming to like, you know, handle the situation. Yeah, that's yeah. different than injured cold showing up with his hands in his armpits and speaking into your brain. Yeah, well, but you know what? He does make that shit look good. <laughs> that's true. All right. That's we're going to talk about the he movie. He does have to get him one of these he does and he did yeah and i think i think that's why we've never seen him again right he got him one of those and he got the hell out of there he got out of there uh so we're gonna talk about the movie the mothman prophecies but before we jump into that we want to talk to you about scarecast mm. stories with happy endings are what we're used to as kids but as we grow older we realize the world isn't such a happy place after all michael crutchfield a popular horror story narrator who originated on youtube as mad mike hosts The Scarecast, a podcast where he tells some of the scariest stories from across the internet. Stories that will keep you gripping the edge of your seat. That's right. The Scarecast podcast features over 100 episodes spanning across six seasons, countless scary stories for you to play during your long drive, at work, or even at your bedside. I know that there are a good amount of people out there who like to listen to podcasts as they fall asleep. Sure. Some people listen to ours. There are a bunch of others out there. This is a fun one to like freak yourself out as you're getting snuggly in your bed. <laughs> Snug um, <laughs> snuggly and spooked. Yeah. The Scarecast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to 
or wherever you listen to your podcasts. So start your scary story binge today. Now. Now. Hurry. Get to it. It's a really cool podcast. Mike is a really cool guy. I'm getting familiar with him and calling him Mike instead of Michael. Sure. I hope that you'll all forgive me. And I think that if you enjoy Guide to the Unknown, you would really enjoy that. So go check it out. Go check it out, everybody. Yes. And thank you, Mike, Michael, for doing a little ad swap with us. We appreciate Hell it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. And also uh, over on Patreon, mm-hmm. patreon.com slash GTTU pod, where you can support us and get a ton of shows. We released a brand new episode this past Monday where we talked about. What the hell did we talk about? I was oh just my thinking God. About it. I know we talked about something. Huh. If you gave me $100 right now, I wouldn't be able to tell you what it is. Really? Well, I'll was it Texas to... Chainsaw? It was. It was Texas Chainsaw. That's was, why we don't remember it. Was it. The, yeah, we wiped it from our brains. It was the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So we reviewed the That's new funny. Netflix movie. That's why we don't remember it. Yes, it is. We both didn't really enjoy it. Because we had to watch Texas Chainsaw. Right. And that was on the heels of watching movies in the original franchise. Neither of us are huge <sighs> fans of it. No. And so I guess our brains were ready to wash their little brainy hands of that. I can't believe it. We saw. I saw somebody say that they walked away from that show going like, I agree with everything that they said. I believe it was Brett Manning. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I, I yep. like, I, you Hi, know. Brett. It, 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 there's a point in the show where um, I know I say this, so if you can't take this flavor of me, I completely understand, but I go like, I'm sorry I sound angry, but I had to watch Texas Chainsaw on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my whole description of why I am the way I am. That's really all you need to know. It was, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. It's like, a, it's like we ate a meal and now we're trying to figure out what the recipe was. That episode, which is one of my favorite things to do, admittedly. Yeah. So go true. check it out. That episode's out there right this second. You can dive in right now. It starts at the ghost tier, starting at $4 a month. Mm-hmm. And this coming Monday, Chris and I are going to be continuing to play Fatal Frame. That's right. Maiden of Black Water. Yeah. And that's going to go out to our demon tier. If you join the demon tier, you get a new guide to the unknown every single Monday. Mm-hmm. It's twice the amount of show. Yeah. as what the rest of the world gets on the public feeds. So uh, uh, go sign up now. Check out our Texas Chainsaw review. Come back Monday as a demon starting at $13 a month to get Fatal Frame and so much else. Oh, yeah. Lots yeah. and lots and lots of shows. Cool. So pretty quickly, I'll tell you about the Mothman Prophecies. Um, it's loosely based on the book, I would say. Yeah. It, it's largely dramatized and fictionalized and stuff. Although there is a character meant to be John Keel, whose name is Alexander Leek. I know, they reverse Keel backwards. Yes, and Richard Gere plays John Klein. Klein. Yeah. So, so it's pretty close. Yeah. Um, so the deal is that Richard Gere is a reporter for the Washington Post who covers mostly like the political beat. And his best friend at work is Steve from Sex and the City. Steve's voice is not as Stevie as it is in later years. So um, if, if anybody out there watches Sex and the City, you may know what I'm referring to. Um, I don't know if it was a direction. I don't know if it was just biological, but he doesn't sound quite as Stevie, which I thought was interesting. Well, he's a guy that like kind of talks like this. Yeah, but it's way more than like that times 20 on Sex and the City. He makes me think of Hank Miranda. Azaria. Yeah. Hank Azaria and more specifically the Professor Frank character. Okay. The flagon. Yeah. <laughs> he makes me think of that guy. That that guy's in this movie for no reason. To no yeah. purpose. He's he's he a really symptom. Isn't. He's a symptom of Richard Gere's professional life. Right. Which doesn't matter in this story. So he not really. Just that yeah. like every once in a while, like Steve from Sex and the City or his boss will call and yeah. be like, get on your normal beat, John. Right. But he's not doing it. So no. it's kind of strange. Or he whispers, I can't. Yeah, right. Everything in this movie is whispering. Whispered. Yes. Um, so Richard Gere is John Klein and he is married to Deborah Messing. They are getting a house together and on the way back from checking it out, she sees, and he's, I guess he sees real quick too, like a mothman flying directly at the car. It yeah. looks really weird. This is when this is from 2002 and the effects looks, don't look it great. Looks bad. Yeah. Um, so the mothman like flies at the car and she crashes the car and has to go to the hospital where she finds out that she has a brain tumor. And so she eventually dies. Now, something puzzling about the brain tumor is that it's shaped like the Mothman. They do an overlay of the shape of the Mothman on her brain scan. And they do it where they're saying, like, this is the area with 
the problem. Yes. And they put the Mothman there. That's correct. So that's odd. Yes. Um, it's all odd. It's yeah. This is not a good movie. It wasn't the worst. A bad movie. It's bad. Yeah. It's it's not a good movie. It is 2002 cheese. Yeah. It is like uh, meant to be like a thriller. It does that l- choppy low frame rate thing. Yeah, I didn't know what you call that, oh, but right. I, it, I can't stand that. <laughs> right, where everything is kind of moving in slow motion yeah. and choppy and a little bit fuzzy every once in a while. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it looks really dated. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, Richard Gere is in mourning. And then randomly, he just gets in his car in the middle of the night and just he just drives. And he ends up... Um, his car breaks down outside of a house. So he goes up to the house. And this is kind of what Will was referring to earlier with John Keel knocking on somebody's door. He knocks on the door because he wants to ask if he can use the phone inside to call a tow truck or whatever was going on. And Will Patton comes to the door with a shotgun like immediately. It's like, oh, I've been waiting for you and pulls him inside, pulls him into the bathtub and keeps pointing the shotgun at him. And it's a good place to accost somebody with a shotgun, though, because it's it's less cleanup. I would say it is easy cleanup. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm guessing Will Patton's wife calls Laura Linney, who's the sheriff. Yeah. And she talks him down so casually. Yeah, I I think she's a pro. She's, uh, she's like, incredible. Let's not elevate this. Oh, it certainly is professionalism. Yeah. Yes. But like, it, it, it she's is cool as a cucumber. Like professionalism of a type. That is like almost superhuman, Oops, and I don't think that we necessarily see in the rest of the movie, where yeah. she's like, all right, Will Patton, why don't you just put the gun down for a second? Right. It's like so, and she, she takes control of everything. It's great. Absolutely. And so they come to find that Will Patton reacted that way because he says this is the third night in a row where at 2.30 in the morning, there was a knock on the door. And uh, what's his name? Richard Gere is there. Right. And he doesn't know why or whatever. And he's kind of had it with it. And Richard Gere's like, I, that wasn't me. I don't know what you're talking about. But at the same time, he doesn't know how I was he at got the pet to... store. Yeah, of course. He doesn't know how. Oh, <laughs> William, we debunked that. We've had three pet store break ins <laughs> last week. <laughs> in Point Pleasant. <laughs> in Point Pleasant. All the gerbils have been taken. At 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. We debunked that, William. You know those scenes in movies where like rats all run away from yes. something paranormal? Yeah, in uh, The Mummy, my favorite <laughs> mummy movie with Tom Cruise. My favorite mummy movie, yeah. The Mummy. Um, yeah, a, a scene where a bunch of gerbils are skittering around on the floor running away from something as <laughs> Richard Gere coming up the stairs in a tuxedo. <laughs> He's the opposite of the Pied Piper. Yeah. Gerbils. We have an episode called Celebrity Urban Legends and we talk about the Richard Gere urban legend and we found that it's not true and it may been started by sylvester stallone and there's so much more to it than you would possibly imagine look they it ha- up they have a feud because sylvester stallone was like eating a whole chicken with mustard on it no reverse reverse oh, Kristen, okay, reverse okay. all right richard gear was the one eating chicken with mustard on it <laughs> and sylvester stallone said that that's gonna stain my pants like you wouldn't believe or <laughs> something like that <laughs> You're right. Yeah. So anyway, so, you know, Richard Gere's car is messed up. So Laura Linney dropped him to a motel. And uh, rather than just getting the car fixed and going home, he ends up staying in Point Pleasant. And, uh, you know, he, he talks to Will Patton about, like, what the weirdness was with the whole thing with him showing up. And uh, Laura Linney also tells him that there have been weird things going on around here lately. So this is just... Another in a series. People have been talking about seeing these like weird winged creatures. She had a strange dream where a voice told her uh, number 37, wake up. Like there's just weird stuff going on. And so Richard Year is interested in this and decides to stick around and look into it. Um, Along the way, uh, Richard Gere and Will Patton become friends and Will Patton starts saying that he has been hearing voices about things that'll happen kind of going along with this same pattern of strange things happening in the town so for example a voice told him that 99 people are going to die in Denver and this voice was coming from his sink yeah, kind of like Tony talking in Danny's yeah. mouth in The Shining so um then Richard Gere is at a diner and he sees on the news that there was a plane crash that 99 people died in. So how did Will Pat know that that was going to happen? What the hell is going on around more, here? More importantly, and this is a question for like the, 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 the folklore of this overall. If the Mothman is a sign of warning, mm-hmm. is it 
intended that we should be able to heed his warning and fix things so people don't lose their lives? I don't Why know. is this voice talking to Will Patton from the sink and saying to him, 99 will die in Denver? He can communicate. Right. Why not take it the extra step and say, at the Denver International Airport, a plane will crash? Why not give a little bit more information? Do something useful. Because right. instead, all you're doing is torturing people and showing up places and per performing vaguely. Partic so, you know, I, I would sometimes for things like this, like, why don't you say more, think, you know, ghosts might take it might take too much energy. They can't elaborate anymore. However, we later see this vo or hear this voice, Injured Cold, having whole conversations. Yeah. So it seems he would be able to elaborate. And I don't know why he didn't in the movie. Exactly. I don't know. Um, so the next day. Will Patton calls Richard Gere and says that Indrid Cold is next to him. I love this. And hands him the phone. This is what Will is talking about. And it's very sweet. I love this so, so much. So it's a creepy voice on the phone that's very like electronic sounding. It's like up here like this. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of like that. And um, kind of like telling Richard Gere things that are going on. He's like, you were born here. Your mom did this. Your dad did this. Whatever. Even and weirder, it goes, it goes like, you were born in the greenhouse. You don't remember what your mother looked like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like uh, things that he couldn't even necessarily tell somebody. I don't remember what my mother looked like. Right. Maybe like a shameful thing that he feels guilty about, though he shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And Indrid Cold is able to tell him. He knows. So Richard Gere does things that are so awesome. Mm -hmm. They're so miniature. Yeah, but it's perfect. So like... You know, he goes, so what's in my hand right now? He opens a drawer and is like, what's on my hand right now? His hand is inside the drawer. So even if you were somehow spying on him, you wouldn't be able to see. And Andrew Cold is like, chapstack. And then, you know, he's like, it is kind of hilarious. Where are my keys or whatever? And he had just put him in his shoe. And Andrew Cold's like, in your shoe. In your shoe. Yeah. It's funny, though, that he like reaches into the drawer and grabs something. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe Richard Gere, like, does he know if it's a battery or chapstick or what? Right. Like, who knows what it might. Maybe he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then it goes chapstick. Chapstick. And it's funny that in this this 2002 thriller that there's a long push in <laughs> on like a 99 cent like lip smackers, like a <laughs> Dr know. Pepper lip smackers in his hand. Maybe it was like product placement or something. A little hilarious. <laughs> um, but then yeah, he throws his watch in his shoe and pushes it under the side table. Mm -hmm. And there's a really weird thing where he goes, "Where's my watch?" And he goes, "In your shoe." <laughs> and he pushes it under the side table, and the voice goes. Under the side table. Mm -hmm. And then there's a huge musical sting. Where it's like, boom! And it, I don't know if Richard Gere is meant to have heard uh -huh. something, or if the movie's just telling us to be scared. Right. I don't know what's actually going on, but the scene is so bonkers. That scene is totally sweet. I love that scene. Yeah, that is really good. In your shoe. In your shoe. Um, so he starts communicating with Indrid Cole, and Indrid Cole will leave him messages, saying things, uh, including one saying that there will be a tragedy along the Ohio River. And so over the course of this, talking to people, hearing their stories, getting these messages from injured colds, um, he's becoming a lot more open to weirdness. But he still wants an explanation for this whole like weird voice on the phone thing. So he brings the, um, he starts taping them and he brings the tapes to, I guess, an audio analyst who somebody, so it's like a, like a what do you call it? a lab like a yeah. i was gonna say a science room and there's one guy who's running his finger along the rim of a glass like i guess making that noise and he has headphones <laughs> on and he's like <sighs> like really listening and i was like okay we get it they study sound here oh my god i don't remember <laughs> he's that. just like off to the side it's no big deal but i was like message received well when i tell people i work in audio uh -huh. that's what i mean <laughs> yeah right <Just laughs> that's what i do at listening home listening hard to like you know yeah playing your wine glass um so you know they they look at the sound waves and do whatever and at first the person is like um yeah this didn't come from like a human body this is mechanical and yeah. technical this noise whatever and richard Gere's like well that's weird and then later on in the movie that guy calls him back and he's like so i analyzed that further i was about i was able to break it down that's your voice on the tape and richard Gere is like no it's not that's a call i received and the guy's like i don't know what to tell you but it's your voice and when that happens richard Gere happens to be by a mirror yeah and he moves but his reflection doesn't move at the same time and then his reflection like turns into the mothman real quick what yeah and oh and then it smashes what doesn't he smash his mirror or he thinks it smashes 
There's uh, a vision of it smashing. Maybe later or something, but not then. Because it just moves on. God, you've, you've seen this movie. I, I, I don't remember this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just watched it. Yeah. So is that... Imp- I, I don't know what that's implying is what I'm saying. It's implying, I think, more of the, the psychic notion. If Indrid Cold even was talking to Woody mm-hmm. Denenberger. Darenberger. Darenberger. And it was happening in his head. It's effectively you talking to yourself. If you're but why head. is he seeing himself as the Mothman? Because he's losing it. And why did his reflection glitch he wasn't even no he didn't even see himself though i'm sorry i i said that wrong he's not even looking in the mirror when that happens really he's like turning away and then it's like the mothman turning away or something it's a 2002 it's exactly that i think it's just something cool and weird yeah um so let's see so he gets a a call from will Patton that's like kind of worrying and weird so he goes to his house to see what's going on and he can't find him he looks in the woods around his house and will Patton is out there on the ground he has died of exposure and so laura linney shows up the cop and says that he was you know he must have been out there all night he died of exposure and richard gear's like but i just talked to him and she's like well when and he's like an hour ago and she's like He's been dead for a long time, so I don't know what you're talking about. Which is fun. Which yeah, is great. totally. Uh, More Will weirdness. Patton's become one with Indrid Cold. Mm-hmm. When he first called anyway, he goes, I'm, I'm, he's here. I'm standing with Indrid Cold. Mm-hmm. That Will Patton awesome voice. Yeah. Um, and so like, yeah, what what's going on? Like, is Will Patton almost becoming one with the force in a mm-hmm. sense? Like, did he get sucked into the psychic madness of this? I think kind of. Yeah. I think that's what they're saying. Um, so other weird things happen, like Deborah Messing's ghost kind of shows up in the street and asks Laura Linney yeah. how Richard Gere is doing. Um, so that messes with his head. Indrid Cold keeps insisting that Richard Gere will meet his wife. Right. And he gives him a message. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, that comes a little bit later. So, uh, so Richard Gere tracks down Arthur Leek who has written books about the paranormal. I don't think they put as fine a point on it to say that he wrote a book about the Mothman, but has written, right? Do they? I don't think they do. No, I don't think so. I I don't, a big, a big question that doesn't need an answer is like, why, why isn't this movie dramatizing the Mm sixties events? Instead, it seems to be some 2002. It's a mashup. Yeah. It's it's, very weird. It's weird. So he kind of like tracks him down the street and he's like, I don't, I don't do that stuff anymore or whatever. But finally Richard Gere gets him to talk to him in a library and um, he, he tells him that he's trying to rationalize things that can't be rationalized. Like he's putting our human ideas onto the Mothman. So by this point in the movie, Richard Gere already has the notion that the Mothman may be um, showing up and predicting events or a warning or something. And he's like, you're putting human ideas onto this. Like, we have no idea what this thing is. We don't know how it thinks. It might not rationalize things that way. Who knows? You should just kind of leave it alone. Um, And when he goes back and talks to Arthur Leake later, Arthur Leake then reveals the reason that he didn't want to talk about this stuff is because he himself was getting warnings and seemingly speaking to Indrid Cold slash the Mothman. And it caused him to fall out of touch with his friends and family. He was committed for a while and now he just doesn't want anything to do with this stuff, but it's real and you need to take it seriously. So Richard Gere uh okay so the people from the newspaper call and they're like hey the governor who you're supposed to be covering is going to be at the chemical plant out there in point pleasant so you should cover that and then richard gear's like chemical plant that's on the ohio river i got that message about the ohio river something bad's gonna happen there so we have to stay away from it so he tells laura linney like don't go anywhere near it stay away and actually he gets out of dodge which is kind of surprising because i feel like in movies usually he would go and like warn them or something and he would look nuts so he drives to charleston which is not insanely far away and is at a bar hanging out and somebody comes up to him with an envelope and is like message for you sir yeah i uh... (laughs) that's how i don't know if that's how things work usually i I, I don't understand but the uh the message says mary will call georgetown friday noon mary is deborah messing that's his His wife wife who has died died. so he does go back to their home in georgetown to wait he does get a call at 12 o'clock when she was supposed to call but he had spoken to laura linney earlier in the day and told all this to her and she said look you're grieving like this is this is all really intense like that's not really what's happening in so many words why don't you come back and have 
it's Christmas Eve. Have Christmas Eve dinner with me. Like, don't let yourself get caught up in all this injured cold stuff. It, it, oh, and she says, like, if there is an injured cold, he's not where Mary is. So he is not getting that message. Yeah. Like, this is something that's not good. Your wife Mary is fine. Like, don't buy into this. And so when the phone rings, he doesn't answer and he rips it out of the wall and is like, all right, well, that's that. That's but, another moment that I like that I, I think is too. really scary. Just the sound of the ringing of the phone and the implication of what it must be. Right. And will he hear his dead wife's voice on the other side? And he rejects the idea of going down that road that might lead to madness mm -hmm. or being manipulated. He just rips it out of the wall. I, I realize that there's an episode of Buffy mm -hmm. where her mom dies. Oh, and then uh, her little sister tries to bring the mom back using right. like Buffy the Vampire Slayer magic. Mm -hmm. They're like, you shouldn't have done that. It's not really going to be her. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the house as you see a silhouette of a person walking up to the front that steps. That is so freaky. It's like the anticipation of seeing somebody who, listen, we've lost loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to let people go. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, in a paranormal sense, it's almost like, I hope I never see them again. Yeah. Because I, I think that the laws of nature are we get people we get to be here then we go away and that's it mm -hmm. and you have to live with that as hard as it may be right and so this scene of richard gear was like really sort of like it, it was it was scary on a very emotional level yeah and i think i thought it was really effective i don't like this movie really one bit yeah but there are a few pieces <laughs> you like it of it two bits two bits you like this part and the Andrew cole part and I, same right i like a look a couple of bits of it but the yeah. couple of bits that i like i really like yeah, yeah. I, i've I mean, ditto. Yeah. Um, but then even though he's ripped the phone out of the wall, it starts ringing again and he still walks away, yeah. which is willpower of steel. I know. To I me, like that. Yeah. Which I also like. So he decides that he is going to go back to Point Pleasant to have Christmas dinner with Laura Linney. And that's when the bridge collapse happens. So this is a big mashup thing. He is on the way back to Point Pleasant and he's on the bridge. Laura Linney's on the bridge for some reason. And the bridge collapse happens. Now, right. I think it's weird that they don't show the Mothman at this point. Yeah. There's there's not a Mothman that flies by or anything. The only thing that, like, they definitely um, focus on these two red lights at the top of the bridge. So it's supposed yeah. to be reminiscent. They do but, that a lot throughout the movie. There's yeah. this visual motif of two points of light, often red points of light. Right. The, the brake lights on a car, mm -hmm. uh, stop lights. Yeah, it's it's pretty well done in that sense yeah. too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I That's am neat. I'm also surprised that nobody that one moment a kid like looks up and I was like, oh my god, we're gonna see like the Mothman flying overhead. No, you only see it at that part where they're in the car driving in the beginning. Do you remember the flying pig from um, Kids in the Hall? No, there's a flying. I haven't watched a lot of pigs. Uh, pigs in the Hall. Pigs in the Hall. Kids in the Hall. <laughs> And, uh, well then yeah. let's just move on <laughs> <laughs> i pretty much know my pen <laughs> like it's it. that guy yeah it's bruce mccullough and yeah. he's he's wearing a pig costume and he's flying and he entertains people who are waiting on line outside okay so he goes yippee look at me <laughs> that's really it yeah but that's the mothman to that's me. that's all you need that's really so, you know, the bridge is collapsing. It's scary. People are falling in the water. Laura Linney is in her cop car and she falls in the water. I hate it when people fall in the water in their cars. It's very scary to me that you're in this little pocket yeah. of whatever, but you're under the water. Blah. But Richard Gere dives in and saves her. I think that he was meant to look a little mothman y when he dove because we're in like a big black coat and he like spreads out his arms to dive. Oh my God. And then goes. You're it's right. It's not really ham handed. But you're, I was you're, like, you're right. I think it's supposed to be. What is this for, though? Right. What does this mean? Yeah. So he's able to rescue her. Long story short, you know, she's in like a blanket that the um, EMTs give her or whatever. And then they, you know, hear somebody say or they say to them that 36 people have fallen in the water. So she would have been number 37. And Wake she, up number 37 right, from her, her dream. dream. And that's the end. And then there's the title card that I told you that says that the Mothman wasn't seen in point pleasant again and i wrote in my notes bad ending does john still talk to injured colt or is this the end of the road for them it sounds Was like it's the, the end of the road man at the bridge what about deborah messing's ghost what's going on with that i think john broke up with injured cold uh, he's not taking call? his calls anymore he's gonna yeah. let it go but the weird mixed messaging is if he's meant to look like the mothman jumping into the water and i do think you're right mm -hmm. um my interpretation of that would be he is still following the premonitions of the Mothman. Hence, right. it is the Mothman that led him to jump mm -hmm. and save. Right. 
um, Laura Linney. Yeah. So the Mothman's warnings did save a life. Right. Um, I guess it's weird, though, that he um, is embodying the Mothman, and yet part of the messaging is he's going to get out of this game a little bit. Um, Also, arbitrarily, they changed the number of people who died in the bridge collapse, which is odd to me. It is weird. And I believe that end text also says the the cause of the bridge collapse was never determined, which is not true. Uh Uh-huh. like I guess I guess part of my my itch here is also like isn't it okay to accept the facts of a situation and then still go like but here are the things we can't explain. Yeah. We can't explain boom 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 boom. People see which this. makes these other th- th- this other runoff, you know, the remainder mm-hmm. is all the more spooky because of that. Right. Um I I all this changing fact. I know it's a movie, it's entertainment, mm-hmm. but like I don't know. I think yeah. it does contribute to what the myth is supposed to be. Yeah, you know? yes, um, definitely. Wh- how do you feel about this movie? Do you like this thing? No, not really. I, yeah. I didn't hate it. It, it wasn't no. the worst or anything, but no, I didn't really like it. It is so quiet. Yeah, it's just kind of like slow and a little dull for, mopey. for what it is. It is very mopey. Everybody's constantly whispering and yeah. pausing. And and I stand. like the people in it. I like Richard Gere. Yeah. I like Laura Linney. I like Will Patton. I like, I, yeah, I like Will Patton fine. There's a moment where... Um, where Richard Gere, when he first, like, I think it's the next day after Will Patton tried to shoot him uh-huh. in a bathtub. Yeah. Where Richard Gere uh, is like, I gotta tell you something. I don't know how I got here. Yeah. He steps so close oh, to Will I know. Patton. I know. They're practically like nose to nose. Their nosies are like almost touching and yes. rubbing. That was so weird. And they're whispering. And this is a guy who tried to shoot you last night. Last night. Like, why are you getting so intimate Why are with you him? whispering into each other's mouths? <laughs> right. They absolutely <laughs> were. And he he accepts it. It's wholeheartedly, so open-mouthedly. They, they all talk this way. I guess so. And That's that, just how, yeah. It, the movie, um, two, two weird thoughts. One mm-hmm. is, and I know this is very on brand, the sound design in this thing mm-hmm. is horrible. Okay. It uses all the stock scare noises uh-huh. that like I, i've played so many video games and seen so many movies that use the same little stings like it's i like, would say those stings i yeah. can imagine it when yeah. we did ghost adventures adventures and when we just found that library of little st- it's all that mm-hmm. which is fine stock effects are meant to be used right but if they're recognizable you need to enmesh them more so that In people don't else. get distracted there's a wilhelm scream yeah on the bridge mm-hmm. um that like Aah! the one that like Indiana Jones throws somebody off a yeah. mountain, you know, <laughs> and in that it's fun because it's campy and 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 big. Right. And in this it's supposed to be stark and scary and real. Well, they also made him, you know, uh, what's his name, Arthur or whatever it was, Alexander Leak. I know it's true. It's a little silly, but they may as well have that sound that Goofy makes when he goes like, "Yeah." <laughs> like it's like just, I don't know. I didn't notice it, so I don't know if it's quite that. There are just so many things that I recognize, and I'm like. Time or budget, yeah, right. <laughs> something, and then uh, the other weird thing 2002. This feels a lot like Book of Shadows Blair Witch 2. Do you feel that at all? No, I mean, bad effects, weird with, surrealism with the the choppy what do you call it, low frame rate or whatever yeah. that happens, but besides that, this hadn't occurred to me. Choppy thriller surrealism, uh huh. It, okay, yeah, yeah, weird effects trying to toy with your. With your reality of watching the movie, even what you talked about, like where he his reflection doesn't move and he does. Yeah. It's like that feels like it would be at home in Blair Witch 2. Yes, because it also just has no explanation. Yeah, no explanation oddity things just for the sake of it. Yeah. That if you look yeah. any closer, you're not rewarded at all. You're Definitely. You're it's definitely just because it was a cool thing. Diminishes. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, William, I have one last mystery for you. Yes. A mystery told in three acts. <gasps> Three reviews of this movie. Fantastic. Okay, so it's one positive review and two negative. Just because the two negative, they were both funny and they were one after the other. So I was like, I'll just include both. Yeah, of yeah, these. yeah. Um, the positive review is from Don M. Collins. Remember that name. This is five out of five stars. Excellent cast, direction, and cinematography. The story, well, you probably already know it. That was the title of this review. Oh. I'd forgotten what an excellent eerie movie this is. For me, it doesn't explain anything, which seems the most realistic part of the Mothman legends. What human really can know the nature of reality? Gear is excellent and is so low-key I forget he is an actor. Same for Laura Linney, who is good in anything I've seen her in. For me, the part that sticks 
is the line. I can't remember exactly. So it didn't stick that well. <laughs> when Gears character asks, is that what you look like? And the Mothman replies, it depends on who is looking. For me, that sums up a human view of reality. It depends on who is looking. Okay. Okay. This is from Don M. Collins. I'll take it. Fine. Now, this one is from Anthony R. This is one out of five stars. Flat, boring, dated. Anyone who likes this film probably hasn't seen many well-made films. The acting is flatter than old soda. The camera tricks are quickly overused. I couldn't watch more than about 35 minutes before I decided I'd rather brush my teeth and go to bed. I'm elated only by my not paying to watch the film. Wow. Okay. I kind of just wanted to say the acting is flatter than uh, I know. It's old soda. Okay, now. It's old soda. This is Joseph M. Collins. Oh. One out of five stars. Just no. You don't know me at all, but trust me when I say I'd... Well, but trust me when I say, don't watch this movie. Don't do it. And if you still do, I say this. You were warned. Whoa. Are Joseph and Dawn related? Yes. Dawn M. Collins loved it. Joseph M. Collins hated it. And insists that we don't know who he is. Right. Which is I maybe to I, distance him from. I think I do know who he is. Yes. I think this is the husband of Dawn M. Collins. I think so. And I think that they're has been a problem in their home because of the Mothman prophecies. And I think they have the same middle name. I think so, too. <laughs> Mary. Mary. Don Mary Collins and yep. Joseph Mary Collins. That's right. Um, incredible. Incredible yes. discovery, Kristen. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we like made... we said, this gives and gives. There's always yeah. more to find. Yes. but And yet we've come to the end. Yes. Uh, so thank you all so much for following us on this journey. Yep. Uh, I think we've given the Mothman his uh, just desserts. I think so, too. Proper due. Yes. Finally. And enjoy. Yes. Justice has been corrected. Mm -hmm. we, Sleep well, yes. sweet Mothman. We hope that you enjoyed this episode and enjoyed our coverage. If you have additional thoughts about the Mothman, please feel free to send them in. Mm -hmm. Additional resources, your own theories. I would love to read them, quite yeah. frankly. GTTUpod at gmail.com is where you can send stuff like that. That would mm -hmm. be kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I really did try to do some justice and, and provide some theories and what do people say and some of my own opinions, of course. You did a gorgeous um, job. Thank you. You're Chris. welcome. Am I digging for compliments too much? <laughs> yes. Oh, go on. No, you're fine. So as we said before, you can go to patreon.com slash pod if you'd like to support the show. And there are a few different tiers so you can choose your own adventure. There's also a Discord that you get access to when you join the Patreon. So thank you so much for everybody who's already there. And I hope if you aren't, then you go check it out. That's right. Waiting for you right now is our Texas Chainsaw review this mm -hmm. past Monday. This coming Monday, we're going to play more Fatal Frame, yep. Maiden of Black Water. So come check that out. Demons get a new show every single Monday. Mm -hmm. Follow at GTTU Pod on all social media to keep up to date with what we're doing. Every link to everything, merch, previous shows, whatever you need, is on the home of Guide to the Unknown, gttupod.com. You can also find us online. Yep, I'm at Chillin' Kristen. I am at The Myth Traveler. So thank you for flying down to Point Pleasant, West Virginia with us. We'll be back next week for more spooky topics to share with all of you. Hmm. But until that time comes, we must travel. Back to the netherworld, go we. Yeah! <laughs> 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 I do love the idea of the moth cam 24 hours and you can watch it. At I love any like 24 hour cam like that. I think it's fun. It's cool.